Good morning and good Sabbath, everyone. Good to say to everyone here, and I guess I'll say everyone online as well. Welcome to Phoenix Seventh Day Baptist Church. Um, now, for you who are here, uh, please notice in the bulletin there's some special events that are coming up in, in the next couple of months. So uh, you can see what they are, and of course you'll be hearing more about them as we get closer. So please pray for these, and, and of course plan to take part. I know I'm especially looking forward to, the, to what they call stir and spur. I think that's going to be a great time. That's in April. Um, are there any other announcements or anything that that we need to hear oh um uh i'll just mention we saw john and annie yesterday uh took took john to the uh rehabilitation where annie is has been working to get back on her feet and i mean she has been on her feet um and so she's scheduled now to go home on Monday. So please pray for her and uh, pray for that time when she can go home. And of course, keep praying for Jim and his uh, battle that he's carrying on right now. All right, again, welcome to everybody. Let's pray. Lord God, we just, just want to thank you for the special events that are coming, we see them as as times for you to to do a great work among us. And so we pray. We pray now. We would continue to pray every day for you to prepare the way and to do your will. At the same time, we know that our regular events are also very important, especially our gathering each Sabbath for worship and fellowship. So ask that you will fill us with your spirit, that we may be able to glorify you in these things today. Amen. Let's sing. Okay, today's uh, scripture reading is a responsive reading. It's on the back of the bulletins. I'll read the regular type, and then we will read the boldface type together. Vindicate me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. Deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man, for you are the God of my strength. Why, Why do you cast me off? Why do I go mourning? because of the oppression of the enemy. Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your tabernacle. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy. And on the harp I will praise you, O God, my God. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted, with, disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, my help and my God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, 
being much more precious than the gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we come together today to fellowship with one another and with you and to rejoice indeed in the strength and the hope that you give us in these times of trials. We ask, Lord, that you come among us now, send your Holy Spirit among us so that we can be inspired to go out into this world and witness to your great glory. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, I've heard this kind of thing many times in the last few years, and I'm sure you have too. The world is a mess. Everything's going wrong. Uh, like, for example, politics, corrupt politicians, the economy getting worse because of inflation and uh, climate change. Hmm, sometimes too hot, sometimes too cold. You figure it out. Morality getting worse all the time. And what is accepted by the society is going down. Uh, predictions, even prophecies, that some major crisis is coming that is going to ruin everything. What a horrible world we live in. Now. Now, if that is true, if any of this is true, people need some good news. And the Christian faith has more good news than any religion or philosophy or uh, political system that you can think of. Everything else has some kind of trade-off. Everything else is at least partly false. But Jesus is not only the way and the life, he is also the truth. And because the Christian faith is true, it is nothing but good news. Now, one thing that ought to sound real good to hurting people is that the gospel, you remember, you remember the word gospel means good news. One thing that should sound real good is that God offers hope to people who trust in him. Now, years ago, I, I heard someone say, I don't know who it was that first said this, but it just kind of hit me at the time and it stuck with me ever since. Someone said, nobody can live without hope. Now, that doesn't come directly from the, from the Bible, but it does agree with the Bible. So today let's think about hope and why Christians should be the most hopeful people in the world. I have two scriptures that I hope are going to show us how this works. So please go first to 1 Timothy 6, and let's read verse 17. 1 Timothy 6, 17. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Now, I expect, as soon as you heard me read this verse, you already decided very quickly, well, that's not talking about me. I'm not rich. I suppose it's a matter of who you're comparing yourself to. Compared to, you know, Jeff 
Bezos and Mark Zuckerberg and all those other high-tech CEOs. Okay, I agree. You and I are not rich. But compare yourself to almost anyone in Africa or Central America or many inner city people in our own country. They would think we are rich. But whether you're rich or not, you do have something. You have income. You have some money. You have stuff. Excuse me. Now, there's nothing wrong with having money or having stuff, except that after a while, we, we kind of get used to it. And maybe it becomes easy to put our trust in our stuff, to hope in it, as Paul said here. Instead, he said, we should put our hope in God. By the way, the, the translation that I read from today has the word trust. Do not trust in riches, but in God. I looked this up in several translations. About half of them said trust, and half of them said hope. Um, the Greek word is hope. So how does hope work? Hope is when you have reason to believe that the present problem is not going to go on forever. Something is going to happen to fix things. Now, maybe you've experienced this in the past, or maybe it's based on a promise from someone you trust. Maybe it's no more than wishful thinking, but somehow you can see the proverbial light at the end of the tunnel, and so you have hope. And the way it works is, if you have hope, you can go on. You can get through this thing that's happening because you believe it's going to get better. Hope is the opposite of despair, and only people who have hope can go on. When the situation is really bad, it's often a matter of survival. Sometimes it's a matter of life and death. Now, one thing we need to get straight is, is the difference between real hope and false hope. False hope is when you, you want something so much, you just convince yourself that you're actually going to get it. Um, it this kind of reminds me of an old heresy that was popular even among some Christians back in the 20th century. Whew, amazing to talk about that like way back then. This was usually called positive confession. Anybody remember that? Uh, supposedly, uh, supposedly you could make something happen just by wanting it and by somehow confessing it into existence. Boy, I, I haven't heard about positive confession in a long time now because I think most Christians finally woke up and saw it for what it really was, false hope. But you don't have to be a Christian to hope for something that is never going to happen. Um, like the story I heard once about a college English class where the English professor was always teaching his students the importance of having a, a good vocabulary, and they should always be learning new words. And so, so one time he told them, here's how it works. If you repeat a word eight or ten times, it will be yours for life. And then in the back of the room, a girl student closed her eyes and said, David, 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 ten times. See, just hoping for something doesn't make it happen. 
That's why Paul said that our hope has to be in God. Hope doesn't really produce anything. God is the one who produces and provides. And again, if we're thinking about people who are rich, and, you know, that might mean filthy rich, or it might mean middle-class rich, like some of us, people who are rich enough to have stuff still need to put their hope in God. The danger of hoping in stuff is that it won't last. It might disappear real fast. And even if it doesn't, it certainly won't last forever. Only God and his kingdom last forever. So this verse promises us that when our hope is in God, he provides for us. And talk about good news. <laughs> this even says that God provides richly all things to enjoy. Another translation says, he richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Enjoyment. Do we believe that? Or do we still have the old idea that when you become a Christian, God doesn't want you to have any fun anymore? He's just taking away everything that you enjoy. Instead, why don't we see this verse for the good news that it is? The promise that hoping and trusting in God will make your life better, not worse. Now, we have to make sure we're not faking it. Uh, no lip service allowed here. We really need to take our eyes off of our stuff and put them on God. The real test comes when you lose some of your stuff. You lose your job. Your house burns down. Uh, somebody cheats you out of something. You lose a lot of money in a bad investment. Whatever might happen, even if you should lose everything, as Job did, are you still putting your hope in God, as Job did? Now, so far we've been seeing how hope works for the here and now in this present life. But genuine Christian hope goes way beyond that. In fact, I would go so far as to say that eternal hope is more important than temporary hope, if I can call it that. And I think Paul would agree. Yes, God does provide everything for our enjoyment in this life. But let's go on to another place where he talked about hope. Let's go to Romans 8. What we're going to read now doesn't contradict what we read in 1 Timothy. It just has a different part of the picture. Romans 8, 24 and 25. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what, what, what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. These verses have something that's very hard to believe, even, even for some Christians. Namely, that Christian hope is a matter of looking ahead into the next life. When Paul says, hope that is seen is not hope, um, <laughs> kind of makes me think of that old saying, you ain't seen nothing yet. Sure, we can be hopeful. For the rest of our natural lives, we can continue trusting that God will provide for us Take care of us? Indeed, we should. We saw that in 1 Timothy 6. 
Romans 8 sees the, the bigger picture that also includes the next life. You think God gives you enjoyment now? You think he blesses you now? You ain't seen nothing yet, right? Just wait till you get to heaven. And that's exactly what Paul told us to do here, to wait. At the end of verse 5, uh, I'm sorry, verse 25, it's we eagerly wait for it with perseverance, or we wait for it patiently. I don't know about you, but waiting is not my favorite thing to do. I mean, when it's waiting for something good. Oh, I can wait a long time for April 15th to come around. Oh, I'd be happy to wait years for the privilege of paying my taxes. But it's hard, excuse me, it's hard to wait for a vacation or a birthday party, but but we have to. And the idea here in Romans 8 is that what God has promised for his children in eternity is worth the wait. Do you ever think about that? That God has some blessings planned for us we haven't seen yet, that we haven't received yet. But that's what hope is. If you already have it, you can't very well hope for it. But if you don't have it, that's where hope really kicks in. And that's what we need to have. Hope for, um, that's why we need to have hope, because we don't have it all yet. So far in the Christian life, we have mainly two things, according to the Bible. Uh, first, we have some good clues, mainly in the Bible. We have clues about what God has planned for us. We have hints about what heaven will be like. These clues are enough to encourage us to wait patiently. And then second, we have what the Bible calls the down payment or deposit, and you should know what that is. That's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in the church and in our lives is the guarantee that all of the rest that God has promised will come. And so again, we wait. So what are we supposed to do while we're waiting? Well, not what you might think, not what you might hope to think. <clears throat> you know, many of us have what, what you could call a waiting room mentality. If you've ever gone for a doctor appointment, you know what I mean. We're used to checking in with the receptionist and then sitting for a period of time doing nothing. Now, in the old days, we might pick up a magazine to look through it. Anymore, we, we look at our phone, or I've gotten to where I like to take a book to read. Either way, we still have to sit and wait. That's not the waiting patiently or eagerly waiting that Paul recommended here. Instead, we need to be active in our waiting. God has given us plenty to do, so we need to be busy obeying him. Um, it would be something like, um, you know, this won't ever happen, of course, but it would be, you know, going back to that waiting room there at the doctor's, it would be like when we're waiting for our appointment, we go up and ask the receptionist if there's something we can do while we're waiting. You know, can we paint one of the rooms or can we sweep, you know, sweep the floor or uh, do something helpful? The nice thing is, 
it's quite possible to wait and to work at the same time. And that's what we need to be spending the rest of our lives doing as we wait for the Lord to come back. Finding things to do that he has told us to do and that he leads us to do. This is how we can live in hope. And we need to see this as good news because there really is nothing better than to keep busy doing God's will at the same time looking forward hopefully and patiently for all the rest that God has planned for us. I hope you can agree about this. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Let's sing it. Thank you.